I'm Dick Lindstrom from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I'm here in New York with uh, three of my colleagues, Cynthia Matosian, Ken Beckman, and Chris Starr. And our goal here this morning is to talk about tear film osmolarity testing and to dispel some of the misconceptions that we hear when we're out talking with our colleagues about this test. In our practices, we found this test has great utility, but we do find there are those that haven't really figured out the way to take advantage of it in their own clinical practices. So the goal is to talk about the common misperceptions, uh, what we would call the myths associated with how this test is utilized, and to give you some real good evidence on how you can use it in your own practice. What is the role of osmolarity in the diagnosis and management of dry eye in your practice? Well, in my practice, I think the, the, the role of osmolarity is really the first, it's the first step in the uh, diagnostic workup. Uh, I have uh, educated and, and sort of empowered my technicians to do a lot of this testing, uh, often without me, my involvement. Uh, and that certainly saves me a lot of time in the long run. Uh, we use questionnaires. Uh, my technicians are very savvy at, at uh, eliciting histories uh, from, from patients. And when there is a symptom suggestive of dry eye or ocular surface dysfunction, uh, the technician then goes ahead and, and the first test that they would get is tear osmolarity. Uh, you want to get that measurement uh, before the tear film is is messed up in, uh, by drops and bright lights and, uh, and, and other interventions. Uh, and so, so that is, and that, that number is very critical as the first number that I look at in a patient who's symptomatic. And uh, as you asked, it's vitally important to the way I practice now. Ken, when are the numbers most important to you when, when you're seeing a patient with potential dry eye? I think the number is important in all of my dry eye patients. There's three aspects to the number that I look at. The first one is helping me make the diagnosis. The second one is to grade how severe it is. And the third one is monitoring progression or monitoring uh, response to treatment. So I really, in any condition that I'm assessing the tear film, I, I really need that number. And I like to look at multiple readings to see how it's changing. So Cynthia, is a, a normal reading helpful? And uh, how does that lead you in your clinical utility? If the symptoms are normal, if all of the other diagnostic tests, which we now are so fortunate to have available to us, are also normal, and the tear osmolarity numbers are normal, that's telling us something. So it's pieces of the puzzle coming together. And if all of these tests are pointing to, quote, normal for dry eye disease, then we have to investigate other disease processes, like is there conjunctival chalasis? Is there a situation of ocular allergies? Maybe there is an eyelid malposition situation, a little lag of thalmos. So these are the types of things that we delve into to see what is causing the patient's symptoms. So Ken, let's you know, give us a couple of examples where tear lab osmolarity has really helped you or, or where okay. not having it might have been a, a problem for you. Okay. Um, I think that oftentimes the osmolarity will give you a positive finding when the other tests are negative. So it can be very helpful early on before the tissue damage has already started. It can be a cataract screening, you know, or a uh, contact lens fitting. You may have, or even more commonly, I have a number of patients that have been sent to me post cataract multifocal implantation, unhappy with their vision. And clinically they look fine. But we know that osmolarity or an abnormal high osmolarity can affect the tear film in the way that you see. It can affect ocular scatter. And being that the tear film is the most important refractive surface of the eye, we will often detect the cause of the problem before you need to start doing visual fields and OCTs and all these other things to explain why the patient's unhappy with their vision on an eye that looks normal. So having a tear lab device in your practice and evaluating osmolarity doesn't really eliminate your value as a clinician. So how do you incorporate this into all the other things that you do? Is it, is it an adjunct is, or a replacement for anything? Yeah, it, it's, it's certainly an adjunct. And I think, uh, you know, it's it, point of care diagnostic testing, whether it's tear lab or something else, it, it certainly helps you as a clinician, but it doesn't take the place of a, of a clinical acumen, a, a good exam. Um, in my practice, it has replaced cer certain things. Uh, Shermer tests I do not do very often anymore. Uh, I find that that's a test uh, that's uh, you know, useful in, in some, some, some situations, but 
uh, as a day-to-day -day test, osmolarity has, has largely replaced that in my practice. I still look at the ocular surface in all my patients, but walking into the room with this tier lab number, and if it's very high, I know already with a very high positive predictive value and sensitivity that this patient has severe dry eye disease, uh, it does make my exam a little quicker, uh, simply because I kind of know the diagnosis walking in. I take a look at the ocular surface. It's confirmed usually by very obvious signs of disease as well. Um, what I do find, though, is that when the, net, when the osmolarity measurement is normal in a patient with, as Cynthia was mentioning, uh, normal in a patient with very significant symptoms that might be ocular surface dysfunction, dry eye disease, or something else, uh, then uh, my exam is sort of geared toward finding what that other thing is that's causing these symptoms, you, uh, but it's probably not traditional dry eye disease. You know, Chris, I, um, I agree with what you're saying about some of the other tests, in particular the Shermer. I use it if I'm considering putting punctal plugs in because I want to make sure that they're deficient um, because I don't want to cause a secondary epiphora. But I do agree the osmolarity is part of every dry eye evaluation where those other tests may be just used from time to time. Go ahead, Cynthia. Um, one other point I wanted to add to all the points that both Chris and Ken just made is the importance of doing this test prior to cataract surgery. You touched on that. It's critically important to get an assessment on the health of the tear film prior to planning cataract surgery and prior to doing all your preoperative measurements. The healthier the tear film, the more accurate your data is going to be. Therefore, you're going to have less refractive surprises. And if you tell the patient ahead of time that they have a preoperative disease process like dry eye, then they will not blame you after the surgery if they end up with some ocular surface issues. So a lot of us have changed the way we practice really now that we have these uh, point of care diagnostic tests like tear film osmolarity and others including you know, MMP9 and the like, to where we've empowered our technicians to really make some of these judgments. And you know, we'll have a, a small number of questions asked. Some people use a, a questionnaire. If there's any evidence of dry eye, then we've empowered our technicians to do this test. I do it on every preoperative patient because I don't want to do a LASIK or a premium IOL on a dry eye. Sometimes they'll uh, also see evidence of uh, dry eye when they do a topography, and they might then go back and get get me a tear from osmolarity. So to really make this flow in our practice, I think the best way is to start right when the patients first come in and they're asking the first few okay. questions and see whether or not there's any triggers to make us want to have a tear from osmolarity. Do you all do kind of the same thing? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. yes. <laughs> so wholeheartedly, yeah. I, I, mean, I think uh, it doesn't take much to, to educate. Technicians are pretty savvy uh, to begin with. Uh, and they've been around this, uh, the eyes and, and the ocular surface and, and working up patients for years in many cases. And to add this extra little bit of education, uh, they, they, they take to it very easily. And they really truly, at least in my practice, um, like having that being empowered, right, to, to do these tests and sort of make these decisions. Um, very rarely will they sort of come to me and say, what do you think, this patient has X, Y, and Z, should I get, you know, they, they know exactly when to do it appropriately uh, in virtually 99% of the cases with very little uh, education uh, up front uh, by me and time, time down. Um, and ultimately, all of that training and, and, their, uh, and their experience actually saves me as a clinician a lot of time, especially when you add up each encounter each day over the weeks and months that we've had this, uh, and years now that we've had this device. I've saved a lot of time thanks to my technicians. Dick, to add on to what Cynthia said on these pre-op cataract evaluations, we've all seen the article that Cynthia was one of the co-authors on looking at the effect of osmolarity on K-readings prior to cataract surgery. So in the same way that a glaucoma specialist has to know the corneal thickness before they can really assess the interocular pressure, I think now you really need to know what's going on with the tear film osmolarity if you're going to take K-readings for cataract surgery. So I agree with you. I like to get the osmolarity before I do uh, cataract surgery. Because if you, if you don't have a good tear film prior to surgery, you may get the wrong lens. And even if you get the lens right, you may have post-op aberrations that are going to affect their outcome as well. So you really need to know this going into, going into surgery. Especially LASIK for me yeah. 
if you go in with a dry eye, you're just not going to get as good an outcome. So yeah. it's best to pre-treat these and, patients. And it's also, I think it's also important to note uh, in, in the cataract age patient, and Bill Trattler's uh, FACO study yeah. showed this well, that, the, that the, <laughs> the incidence or prevalence of dry eye disease in the pre-op cataract patient is way higher than anyone ever thought. Um, and when you look at the ASCRS survey, people still think about 20% of patients have dry eyes in, in the pre-op cataract stage. But this FACO study showed it was closer to about 80% of people had very significant stage three uh, dry eye disease. Uh, and a lot of those patients, A, weren't complaining about it. Uh, they had not had a prior diagnosis of dry eye disease. And so when you're sort of focusing on that cataract and doing surgery and all of the preoperative uh, counseling and all that goes into that, sometimes the dry eye gets swept under the rug. But we know that also with various incisions, whether it be cataract or LASIK or PRK or whatever, we're probably we're going to have an effect on the corneal nerves. That eye is probably going to get drier afterwards. And if it's a premium IOL or a laser vision correction patient who expects perfection, as they all do these days, uh, you're going to have a lot of trouble if you don't identify this preoperatively. Yeah. It's great that you brought up that study because it had such a high number of patients at level two and three. Mm -hmm. yeah. So by definition, they have corneal surface disease. They have epithelial breakdown, uh, SPK, possibly filaments. So there's no way a K reading can be accurate. There's no way a topography can be accurate. You're just playing Russian roulette with your, with your lens selection. And that's exactly what our study showed. The numbers in hyperosmolar patients were so unpredictable that from visit to visit, sometimes we had up to 3.5 diopters of astigmatic change in their measurements. That's huge. Think of how that's going to relate to an IOL power calculation.